The Brainiac Corporation. Just another day. From all over the country, a crack team of the finest minds arrive at their base. Morning. Their mission, to push back the boundaries of scientific knowledge. Uh, mate. So come on in, step inside with us, but prepare yourself for a bumpy ride as we embark on the worst excesses that are Brainiac Science Abuse. <laughs> to Brainiac, the show that does for science what Nitro does for glycerin. The big science tonight. We race against high explosives. Quick, 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 it's catching up, quick! We show you why you shouldn't put dynamite in your microwave. We tell you how to win on the fairground grabber. And John Tickle puts his foot down in garlic. That's not the most pleasant thing in the world. But first... Joanna Craft is a majorette for the Tristar Twirlers. Her speciality, twiddling with a couple of sticks in front of crowds of people. It requires coordination, timing and poise. Qualities which Joanna, as you can see, has in spades. But introduce her to some low-amp 9-volt electrical equipment and what might happen next. This is an experiment to see how well people do their job whilst being electrocuted. Will we be able to see any difference in her performance when jolted with electricity? The answer? Oh, my God! Yes. <laughs> Screeching is not normally a feature of Joanna's act, and it does sort of get in the way of the overall effect <laughs> of her display. Dropping the baton, also a clear sign that the zaps are impeding her performance. The small crowd seem genuinely unimpressed. Clear disinterest, a far cry from the usual stadium applause which greets her work. Joanna can barely keep the bat on moving, which is, after all, a basic requirement for the job. The proof is clear. Before the zaps, good. After the zaps, bad. From coordinated and graceful to cack-handed and rubbish. Empirical evidence that doing your job is indeed a lot harder when being electrocuted. Here's one for you. If a word was misspelt in the dictionary, how would you know? Normally, I find it pretty easy to get to sleep. Head down, eyes shut, and eight hours later, it's morning. But then sometimes, if a question gets into my head, it starts to niggle, and I just can't sleep until I've answered it. Like this one, for instance. You know when you suck in helium, your voice goes all high? Well, what happens if you do that and then blow into one of these? Brainiac. Right, it's concert time. The audience are ready, we have a piano, we have a conductor. So, bring on the band. Wind instruments, of course. Do you know, I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. It might have no effect whatsoever, in which case it's going to be a bit of a waste of time getting this lot in. Still, let's find out if it works. Right, if you all want to get settled down and do whatever you've got to do in the way of tuning up and preparing yourselves, OK, then we'll pass around some balloons full of helium and uh, then we'll give it a go. So, while they tune up, we fill up balloons full of helium for the sucking of. Your vocal cords vibrate faster through helium than they do through air. That makes your voice sound higher. But will it pitch the band up an octave or two? OK, I think we're all set, but before we do this with helium, we've got to hear what you sound like without. So, let's do that. Let's play it without, first of all. OK, this all sounds pretty much in tune. All the right notes in the right order. Very nice. 
Thank you. That's very nice. Very nice indeed. Now, we're going to do it with helium. So, this is quite complicated, so pay attention, because we've got to make sure... You can't just take a big, deep breath of helium now and then wait until we start, because you'll faint, because you won't be breathing, and then we won't know if it works. So, we're going to set the introduction going. While the introduction is playing, those of you with a helium brainiac next to you will take your deep breath of helium, hold it, and then play at the proper moment. From here on in, I've no idea. Introduction starts, you take your breath, you play, we'll see. Right, everybody happy? On you go. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Big deep breaths, deep breaths. <laughs> That's... Well, quite clearly, it wor was that real, everybody? That was, you're not just suddenly rubbish. <laughs> That was amazing. Right, I want to do one more, one more experiment here while we do this, OK? Let's just, let's just really hear how this works. I'm going to pick on you, sorry. Just play me a note, any note, without helium. Just clear your lungs of helium first. Take some... Oh, big, oh, there you go. Right, what note was that? A B. That was a B. Take some helium and then try and play the same note and we'll, we'll actually get a measure of this. <laughs> sorry to do this to you in front of everybody. Fantastic! So, why does it work? Well, sucking in helium affects not only your vocal cords, because helium is thinner than air, sound will travel faster. The result? You get a higher frequency tone when you blow through the instrument. But there we go, the question has been answered. Another middle of the night, keep you awake question solved. Helium does affect wind instruments. <laughs> Stop. The following experiment is dangerous. Do not try this at home. No, really, don't. Dynamite is a nitroglycerin-based explosive. Ball bearings are made of steel. When ball bearings are microwave, they cause an electrical reaction. But only when they roll together do they provide an actual sparking point. When that does happen, the spark ignites the fuse wire, which fizzes and burns the shell of the microwave. When the fuse burns down to the explosive, the dynamite blows the doors off. We do these experiments so you don't have to. Do not try this at home. Brilliant. Squash, prong or... Scoop. Which is the best way to eat peas? <laughs> Three brainiacs. Each has his own plate of peas. Who will be the first to clear their plate? Get ready. Eat peas. Each has to eat their tiny vegetables according to the chosen method. And like all good boys, they have to clear their plate. None are allowed to get away. Each Brainiac has minders to identify and return errant peas to their plate. Peas have a tough, shiny coat known as the tester. It makes them difficult to pierce and equally tricky to digest. It's hard work for Pronger Boy, and the pea's slippery surface causes much spillage. Mr Squasherman's method exposes the soft, fleshy innards of the pea. It gives him a larger surface area to work with and overcomes the friction problem, but he does waste a lot of time mashing, which he could spend shoveling into his mouth. Scooper Boy is having problems with the inherently spherical nature of the pea. There's a lot of rolling and spilling, which is keeping his mind as busy. However, when they do get on board the fork, they do go down in good quantities. Apparently, the average Brit eats 9,000 peas per year. These boys are certainly doing their bit for the nation, but who will finish their plate first? It really is nip and tuck now. The squasher matching the scooper pea for pea, while Pronger is really getting stuck in, albeit unproductively. But shoveling away like a demented JCB, Scooper Boy pushes his nose out in front and forks his way to a fine win. Finish. Got them all? Scooper wins! Yeah! Playing the part of the magnanimous winner, truly graceless in victory, but understandably exultant. Scooping, then, the best way forward with the pea. Yes! Hello. Oh, I'm Jenny Boy.
one. <laughs> and you're watching Brainiac. Oh, isn't this weird? I should read the news like this from Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Brainiac. Will it fizz or will it bang? The regular chemistry conundrum as posed by Dr John P. Kilcoyne, Principal Lecturer of the University of Sunderland. So, what chemicals has Dr Kilcoyne got in his shed today? Glucose and potassium chlorate, sulfuric acid. Will it fizz or will it bang? Stay tuned for the answer. Dr John Kilcoyne of the University of Sunderland posed the question, glucose, potassium chlorate and sulfuric acid, will it fizz or will it bang? The answer? It fizzes. The sulfuric acid generates heat to trigger the reaction. The glucose is then oxidised by the chlorate, producing water, CO2 and a violent pink fizz. What a great fizz! Nice one, Doc! <laughs> Dear John, my grandma swears that rubbing garlic into the soles of her feet helps relieve tired aches and pains. However, it appears to cause an unfortunate side effect, making her breath smell of garlic too. Is the garlic on her feet really giving her garlic breath, or do all old people smell like this? Yours, Clive from Scunthorpe. Well, Clive, let's have a look, shall we? OK, I've brought my feet. And I've got plenty of garlic. Ordinary garlic, elephant garlic, and an enormous amount of garlic paste. I guess there's only one thing for it. I'd best get chopping. Here we go. Small stuff first. At least I know how to chop this. Nice and fine for the small stuff. Right, that's ordinary garlic, but we don't like small stuff on Brainiac. We like the big stuff. Elephant garlic. Never come across this before, but good lord. Really is making my eyes water a treat. Okay, that's enough garlic. It's all nicely chopped, and I've got the garlic paste too. What I need now is an effective foot delivery system. And I've chosen these a pair of Wellington boots. They should do very nicely indeed. Let's start getting the garlic in. Nice handfuls in there, shared out between the boots. And now, for some garlic paste. In that goes. Oh, splendid stuff. Yeah, like a bit of that. Ooh. No, ooh. Right, that's the wellies well and truly full of garlic. So let's see what they're like on. The theory works like this. As I rub garlic into my feet by Wellington boot action, Chemicals from the garlic are absorbed through my skin and into my bloodstream. Oh, that's not the most pleasant thing in the world. The blood then moves around my body and eventually finds my lungs, where some of the garlic is transferred into my breath, along with all the gases that are normally passing backwards and forwards as I breathe. Now, as you'd expect, hardly any garlic makes it all the way from the surface of my feet, through my body and to my breath. But the chemicals in garlic are so strong, it shouldn't take much to give me a convincing garlic breath. Oh, yes, I think that's just about done. Right, time for the test. Right. Oh, that's so squidgy. Just going upstairs for a second opinion about the quality of my breath. Ooh, ah, oh, that's gross. Not nice sounds there. Right, here we go. Let's see if anyone's in. Hello there. Hello. I'm John from downstairs. Hello, John. Hello. Sorry for the invasion, but I've just been conducting an experiment downstairs. I wondered if you'd be able to smell my breath for me. Smell your breath? Yes. Okay, right. Okay. Now, what does that remind you of? Onions. Onions. Yes. Could we go as far as garlic, perhaps? Uh, no, more onions. I think. More onions. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much for your help. You're Cheers. Bye-bye.
So there we have it, Clive. Not garlic, perhaps, but onions, but I think we've still proven the point. Rubbing stuff into your feet can affect the way your breath smells. Now all I've got to do is find out whether I can get the garlic smell out of my feet. Forty-seven Seconds Science. Big science questions answered in bite-sized chunks. How far will a pencil write? Setting out, armed with a single HB and a trundle wheel, the Brainiac way is to go out and do wherever it takes us. It's sharpen and draw. One pencil, one line, all the way. The great British weather won't hold back the progress of science, nor the long arm of the law. Of course, we could do this mathematically, but where's the fun in that? Two grams of graphite goes a long way. That's why you've got drawers full of half-used pencils at home. All the way from a long HB to a handful of wood and graphite dust. A pencil can write for 6,714 metres. That's over four miles. Great. Now go and rub it out. Dr Bunhead on the road, where science's biggest loser peddles chemistry to the masses. an ice cream. Look, what does that say? Dr Bunhead's ices. Oh, yeah, so it does. Um, <clears throat> sorry. No. Do see my flower bomb? There we go. Oh, a big bag of flour. And then what I'm going to do... Bottle of liquid nitrogen. Now, at the moment, perfectly safe. But if I put the lid on, it becomes very, very dangerous. So I'm just going to pop that in there. And uh, I think I need to take some safety precautions myself. Here we go. I oh, know, just wait. Could go any time. Don't take all day. Oh, well, oh, yeah, cheeky, asking me for something and then give me lip. Uh, pop that out there. Any minute, that could be a catastrophe. That's a minute. And here we go. Um. It's not smoking, so that's a good sign. Oh, it is smoking. Oh, I think we've got a leak. Sounds like a leaky bottle. And just chuck that in the rubbish. Oh, crikey. Whoa! <laughs> that's a flower bomb. Oh. Safety in the home. A constant concern for the staff at Brainiac Corporation. Whether it's working out the most dangerous oil in the house, cooking oil, or the slippiest socks, woolen ones, we're always on our guard against lurking household dangers. In the spirit of this, we've laid out three identical lino runways, each polished to perfection as we aim to discover which is Britain's slidiest food. First up, the prime slippy candidate in all good comic books, the humble banana. This being a scientific investigation, we're taking the precision approach to banana mashing with shovels and garden rollers. For our Brainiac to slide successfully, it's vital he gets a good buffing from the coach. And makes it to the start line in one piece. So, just how slidey are bananas? A pacey runner and one long slither across the spillage. <laughs> Not bad. Slidey Boy glides away an impressive 9.53 metres. Quite a stopping distance and a tough target to beat. Next up, a raid on the local chippy garnered half a hundredweight of assorted sliced and fried potatoes. And we've even included crinkle cuts, hoping the increased surface area provides even more grease to slide on. So, just how dangerous is the common or garden chip? It's all in the slide. And the answer is, not very. Slithering to a rather sorry 5.7 metres. Way short of the bananas and a bit of a disappointment all round. 
Chips, good for vitamin C and complex carbohydrates. Rubbish for sliding. Now, the final challenger. Eels can live up to 35 years. Not these ones, obviously. Cockneys have been enjoying this jellied version for over a century. And now, it's our turn. 9.53 metres to beat them. And there he goes. What an incredible slither. He glides gracefully right off the end of the runway. Coming to a halt a staggering 11 metres down the track. Jelly deals there. Officially the worst stuff to drop on your kitchen floor, but top of the tree for the best running glide. Nice one, slider. The fairground grabber, so badly named. What is it with these things? It looks like money for old rope. Coins in, the claw hovers over a tempting prize. You're in position, and down it goes. Got it. And then, suddenly, you haven't, and it's more wasted cash. Will you always be a loser, or can science step in to help? Of course it can. Brainiacs make a living of looking for ways to beat the system and run off with the loot. And here's how to do it with the Funfair Grammar. OK, let's have a little peek inside. Lurking in the workings of all these machines is a little yellow box like this one. And it's this that aims to part you with your cash. It operates with two settings. It tells the grabber how many times it should pay out and also how hard it should grip the toy. If you want to win at these machines, you're going to have to beat the yellow box. So, how do you do it? Well, firstly, like all good scientists, you have to put in the research. The yellow box sets the machine to pay out after a certain number of plays. So it's one in five or one in ten or whatever. You have to lurk and watch. What you're looking for is a win. Once you've seen one, start counting. Just watch those other suckers come up and lose, because their loss is going to be your gain. Once there's another win, you know the magic number. That's the yellow box setting. Now all you have to do is count up till you know when the next win's due, and then in you go. But it's not over yet. Remember that other setting, the strength of the gripper. Even though it's due to win, you have to be careful, as if the electromagnet in the claw is set too loose, it may still drop the prize. Always go for what you can actually reach, and don't play an overfull machine, or you may still lose. But get it right, and the loot is yours. Brainiac Funfair Science, yes. helping you beat the system. Yes! Who reads instruction manuals? No. For instance, buy yourself a brand new dishwasher and most people just plug it in and try and work out the knobs and buttons all by themselves. However, if you did read the instructions, you'd probably find there are a lot of things you shouldn't do with your new machine. You shouldn't overfill it. You must use the right powder. Don't ever open the machine when it's on. But there is one thing you should certainly never do with your new dishwasher, and they don't tell you about that. Heavy industrial cranes come in many different sizes. 30 foot, 50 foot, 100 foot even. They can carry things like dishwashers way up into the sky. Sir Isaac Newton reckoned that there is an unseen force that acts upon every object, which basically means that if you drop something, it'll hit the ground very smartish. And who are we to argue? Accelerating at a maximum rate of 32 feet per second per second, a dishwasher hits the ground, well, pretty hard. No matter how you look at it, it's quite clear this is the kind of thing you should not do if you want a long life out of your new machine. These dishes aren't going to need much in the way of further cleaning. A lesson for us all, then. Do not drop your brand-new dishwasher off a 100-foot crane. And, of course, don't try this at home. Think you're good at maths? You're going to get this sum wrong. Add together the following numbers. 1,000 plus 40 plus 1,000 plus 30 plus 
1000 plus 20 plus 1000 plus 10. The answer? 4100. But most people make it 5000. Did you get it right? I can do science, me. <laughs> Science you want done. You write to us and we'll give you the tools for the job. This week, we're in Shadwell, grabbing wrestling enthusiast Tom Summers. Oi. If you're lucky enough to be selected, then you too could be picked up in style by the Brainiac team and chauffeur-driven to our top-secret, state-of-the-art research laboratory. For all of you wannabe scientists out there, it's your chance to get really scientific. Get your thinking caps on and your ideas into us. Who knows, we might just pick you. It's I Can Do Science Me with Charlotte Hudson. <sighs> another day, another letter. Dear Brainiac, I've always wanted to know, can I jump further if I swing my arms with two heavy weights in my hands? Do you know, despite myself, I quite want to know too. Give him what he needs. Let's get on with it. So why might you jump further carrying a weight? Not quite as witless as it sounds, because whereas you may get less lift-off power, you will get more impetus pulling you forward. So after this strange arm-waving ritual, he makes a good lift-off, a firm landing, and he's got himself a mark to beat. Just how far did he fly? Two metres, 31. So, first jump completed, a mighty leap of 2 metres 31. Wait him up then. This experiment is all about momentum. Will the added weight give him more forward thrust or just drag him down? So, dumb boy with the dumbbells, off you go then. He takes off again and flies as far as his weedy legs can hurl him. But how far? Further than before? Two metres, 26. Nope. Two leaps, two landings, but the added weight on the second just dragged him down too much, much as logic would dictate. His name is Tom Summers. He wanted to know if he could jump further with two heavy weights in his hands. The answer? No. I can do science, me. If there's one thing Brainiac viewers can't get enough of, it is thermite, the scorching substance that's hotter than a vicar at choir practice. Every week, the Brainiac office is inundated with hundreds of letters and emails, like this one from 33-year-old Dan Inslee of Stroud. Dear Brainiac, if thermite is so hot, then why not pour it on something extremely cold and see if the effects cancel out? I'd suggest liquid nitrogen. I like your thinking, Dan. Liquid nitrogen. That is quite cold. This is thermite. It's a powdered mixture of iron oxide and aluminium, which, when ignited, burns at 2,500 degrees Celsius, which is very, very hot. This is liquid nitrogen. It's specially stored at minus 198 degrees Celsius. That's 163 degrees colder than the North Pole in winter. But is it cold enough to neutralise the intense heat of thermite? Packed into the slow-release mechanism of a garden flower pot, the thermite is ready for action. Just light the touch paper and stand well back. The fuse triggers the irreversible thermite reaction. As scorching hot meets freezing cold, a fierce battle rages. The smoke clears and, incredibly, nothing remains. As the thermite burns at 2,500 degrees, it releases a raging torrent of molten iron, which rains down upon the liquid nitrogen, boiling the glacial mixture away in a plume of vapour and melting the cylinder, leaving just a puddle of white-hot iron. A clear victory for thermite. 
So there you go, Dan. Adding something coal to thermite doesn't cancel it out. It just makes it angry. Thermite. You won't like it when it's angry. Granny Brainiac. Homespun science from the nation's favourite old dear. Oh, no, Granny. I've got blood on my shirt. Oh, don't worry, dear. I'll fix it. Getting blood on your favourite T-shirt can be a bit of a nightmare. But Granny knows how to fix it. A little dab of shampoo will loosen that stain and remove the pigment in no time. However, Granny needs a lot more. But don't worry. We can lend a helping hand. Here you go, Granny. A liberal application should soon fix the problem. Yes, that should do it. Thanks, Granny. Good as new. Oh, yes, Granny knows best. She certainly does. Homespun science from the nation's favourite old dear. <laughs> Will it break? Or will it bounce? The big question answered by Professor Myang Lee and her 10-foot drop. Today's object, a remote control car. So, will it break or will it bounce? We'll be giving you the answer shortly. Earlier in the show, we asked, will a remote control car break or will it bounce? The answer, a remote control car bounces. And off it goes. Thanks, Prof. You're lovely. Brainiac. Which is faster, gunpowder or Brainiac? This Brainiac can run at a top speed of 12 miles an hour. Full of beer and pizza, he's not quite as nippy. And the further he runs, the slower he gets. Gunpowder explodes at 1,800 miles an hour. What the hell does that mean? We want to know the straight line speed, which is why we've set out this course. A line of gunpowder runs the length of this course, over, under, around and through the various obstacles, and our Brainiac will be racing alongside it. At the end of the course, two caravans, each filled with more explosive black powder. The winner is the first one to explode their respective caravan. So, I'm going to light the powder. When it starts, I will shout, go, and at that point, Brainiac, you, uh, well, go. OK, if you're ready, here we go. I'm lighting it. Go! OK, our Brainiac's off, the gunpowder is away, into the tunnel, first of all. There's a lot of smoke here, the gunpowder is already through the tunnel, the Brainiac appears... Come on, man, this is pathetic! The gunpowder really is romping ahead, you're going to have to move, move, come on! Whoa, 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 back to the beginning of that, you weren't in the tyres, you've got to do it properly, one foot in each tyre, the gunpowder is racing ahead of you at the moment. Oh, right, now you've got to balance on here, a bit of skill. Can't believe how close this is. Up here and balance over, and it is getting ahead of you. Come on, Brainiac, up you go. Go! Right, round the coast, go! This is special high speed gunpowder in this stretch. It's going to be very fast and very hot. Go, 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 go! Now, underneath, you are ahead. Go, go! Under the car, Brainiac! Quick, quick, quick! It's catching! Quick! It's going under the car, Brainiac! It's going to be so close! Absolutely amazing. A 12 mile an hour Brainiac managed to beat 1,800 mile an hour gunpowder. Hello, I'm the Lady Messenger. You're watching Brainiac. <laughs> and the frightening thing is, it sounds suspiciously like my normal voice. Brainiac! Men versus women. The battle of the sexes has gone on now since time immemorial. Who's the smarter? Who's the better driver? We've heard it all before. But there is one dispute between men and women that's gone untested for centuries. And it's this. Who spends the longer in the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> 
cleaning cameras onto toilets has, up to now, been an activity restricted to the sick and the weird. Most brainiacs, of course, fit neatly into both of those two categories, but this time it's all in the cause of science. Men and women. We count them all in and count them all out again too. Starting the stopwatch when they go through the lab door and stopping it again when they emerge. Some race through it. 38 seconds from entry to exit. No hand washing going on here. Others really like to luxuriate. Eighteen minutes for this chap, obviously in a great rush to get back to his work. But these are freaks. An average score will give us a considered verdict. The evidence is examined in detail, studying all the angles and adding up the numbers. And the answer? It is women who take longer in the loo. An average time of 4 minutes and 18 seconds, a third longer than men. These slash and dash merchants took an average of only two minutes to accomplish whatever they were doing in there. So, what was going on behind closed doors? The problem is, we don't know. We didn't have cameras in the cubicles, so they could have been doing, well, anything. We need a more rigorous test. Down at the lab, one man and one woman. Like a latter-day Adam and Eve, they are here to represent their species. We're going to keep a close eye on these two. It's weeing only allowed when they get to the smallest room. We start with a level playing field. Did you have a wee-wee before you came? I did. And what about you? Yes, I did. Lovely. It's time to fill them up. Each subject gets a carefully measured glass of water. Now we need time for nature to take its course. We're going to leave them hanging around for exactly two hours. By the end, they should both be fit for bursting. The question is, who will burst quickest? Size of bladder, length of journey, speed of delivery, all factors that will play their part in who gets rid of their we the quickest. Time's up. Two hours up. They're primed and ready for the off. OK. Ready, steady, go for a wee. <laughs> the only rule, weeing only allowed. No reading, playing or even washing hands. And 47 seconds later... It's the woman who pops out first, with the man trailing in eight seconds behind. Have you been? Yes. Good. So, it's women who wee faster than men. Okay. Which leaves one question still unanswered. If women do wee quicker than men, but they're spending longer in the bog, what on earth are they doing in there? Here's one for you. Where would we be without rhetorical questions? Pub Science, the brainiac alternative to crying into your pint. If I showed you something very cool, would you give me a kiss? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. They don't normally say yeah. If I take this balloon filled with water... Yeah. I bet you I could heat it up and it won't melt the balloon. I haven't actually tried this before, but it works in theory. So what I'm going to do is just hold that up there. Look, look at that. Absolutely... Oh, it is working. Look, look at that, it is working. It's heating the water up. That is the conduction of heat through the rubber and into the water. Oh, it has made a tiny hole. Ta-da! It worked! It works! Oh, dear. <laughs> Can I have a kiss anyway? No. Go on. No. <laughs> Hot bits. Don't come back! Oh, ow, no! Ow, ow, ow! The 
lad on the left is John. The lass on the right is Jane. So far on Lad vs Lass, we found that lads are better at remembering appearances. But lasses have superior colour differentiation. <laughs> Today, our prime examples of man and woman have another assignment. To see whether it's better to be a lad or a lass in a staring contest. One lad, one lass, four eyes and no blinking. Blinking is a reflex action designed to spread tears around the eyes, keeping them moist and clean. The drier the eyes become, the stronger the blink reflex and the harder it is to maintain a solid stare. So, the introduction of some mini fans should help things along nicely. According to scientists, women blink more than men and our lass certainly looks to be struggling. This tear is a result of her lacrimal glands desperately trying to hydrate the eyeball. But while she's got two fans stuffed in her face, there's no chance of that. Time to swap fans for torches. Strobe lights are another way of stimulating the blink response. The bright flashes penetrate the eye and the body's reaction is to blink because too much light is very painful. Of course, these two will just have to put up with it. But that's the price we pay for science. Our specimens are proving hard to crack. So it's time to roll out the ultimate anti-eye weapon, vapor rub. A tub aimed directly at the face should do the trick. Oh, hold on. No, our lad nearly blinked then. Clearly, soothing chest vapours aren't nearly as soothing on the eyeball. And there it is. Against all expectations, the first blink comes from our lad. Yay! Lad blinked. That means lass is the winner. Yay! So there you go. Scientists may say women blink more than men, but when it comes to staring your opponent down through a haze of menthol, clearly it's better to be a lass than a lad. Marvellous. It's that time again, pro-celebrity Brainiac Golf. No Jimmy Tarbuck in sight, though. We've got top professional Jimmy Spence to take on, bottom of the ratings, Brainiac Golf Boy. Jimmy doesn't look entirely sure of what's going on, but he should know the score by now. We've got eight caravans, each filled with a bomb and a different chemical. This week, it's lead nitrate. When the ball goes in the hole, it sets off the fuse wire, which travels up the flag and along to the caravan setting off a huge explosion and a different colour flame, depending on the chemical. Bit of a long one for Jamie this. Now, how is he going to uh, approach it? Aha, that way. He's good, this boy. Very good, with either end of the putter. The ball drops in, setting off the inevitable course of events. Best now not to hang around thinking of what might have been. Plenty of time for that on the 19th hole. Not much time to get away before the place goes up in flames. And as everyone makes their exit, the whole place fills with smoke and bangs as the fuse meets the caravan. And there she blows. Lead nitrate burns with a very pretty blue and white flame. As metals go, lead is pretty ordinary, but it's quite a lot of fun when it's sizzling at the heart of a 1970s camper-style caravan. A perfect end, then, to a perfect round of Brainiac Golf. Nothing says goodbye better than a final bang. 